uh, kind of how this all got started here was, was I don't know, it's been a few weeks back that uh, I showed Karen a video on, uh, on Daniel's timeline. And um, let's see if I can make this thing work here. Oh, look at that. And, uh, and, the, and the guy that, that presented it on the video, his, his name is Dewey Bruton. And, uh, and I know that she was, was rather astounded by the information in the video. She wanted Vic to, to see the video. He watched it. He was taken back by the whole thing. And somehow or another, I know Pastor Pete, Vic, myself, we got to talking. And, and we decided that um, you know, this information should be shared. People should, should, uh, should know about it. And uh, so that's how we got decided this idea of, of doing this little series here. And so um, it, it's, it's, kinda, it's kind of a, you know, something that a lo- really has a, it's kind of can, how do you want to say this, can seem kind of foreign to the, to the Christians because these are kinds of things in the Bible that we typically have not studied much. Um, if he was to actually talk to a Jew about this stuff, they would, they would quickly catch on to it because they have, they have understood this part of the Bible you know, historically, and uh, and so uh, we're that's we're going to we're going to head off into, into this topic. Uh, there's several things that um, you know the the video itself here. Let me back up. The video itself is like a two-hour video, and it's, there's just like there's no way we can get through all that, all the information in one evening. And and so tonight, what we're going to do is is kind of lay down the foundation that. That he himself presents for this teaching, and so that's what we're going to do tonight. And uh, I mean, if you're looking for the hard-hitting punchline or something like that, you know, it's probably more like next week that we really start to for this thing to really start to develop and understand the day that we live in and what's what's getting ready to happen. And uh, And I think that's a pretty good intro to all this. <laughs> I had a drum roll back there, just no sound. <laughs> I will say that I don't miss it. I mean, just don't miss it. Mm-hmm. It is one of the most interesting things I've seen in a long time. And, and so, anyway, so Dewey Bruton timeline so as I mean and so a lot of this stuff I'm, I'm just kind of following his his uh, his outline there's a few things I'm, I'm I'll interject myself here tonight just because how I got to I came to a very similar point myself on this whole thing and uh, but anyway this this is a comment that he makes at the beginning he goes you know that that there are things that are hidden in plain sight and and a lot of these things you know like I said maybe it's not hard to understand. It's, but sometimes the first time you hear something, it's like, well, that sounds really foreign. That's really different, and and it's really not so complicated. It's just, and and I think that's really the, often the way it is. If you've spent much time with God, there are times when He will reveal things to you, and it's like, well, yeah, that's the way it is. Why didn't I see that before? Now, you know, and so I think that a lot of that takes place in in this whole s- series of teaching too. So. I myself, you know, I know my, uh, he, and, and this video that, that they, I shared with, with uh, Karen and Vic, you know, it was done in like 2005, and it was probably about 1994 that I first became interested in the biblical calendar, and, and, how, and how it all got started is, is as I was reading the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, two popular prophecy books, and and at first glance, there's some things in here that I had never noticed before. But as I was studying, I was like, well, there's, I don't understand this. So, like in, in Daniel, Daniel talks about 1,290 days. And, and, but Revelation talks about 1,260 days. And, and, I can, and I can, like, remember thinking to myself, it's like, Boy, there was, those are similar numbers. Did somebody get their nine written upside down here? Did somebody turn their six around? You know, I was like, why, why similar numbers, but but why different? And and then uh, the book of Daniel mentions 
a period of 1,335 days, but the book of Revelation does not mention that number, but it does talk about 42 months. And by the way, 1,260 days or 1,290 days, either one of those is approximately three and a half years. And 42 months, well, that's three and a half years. And, and again, it's like, well, Revelation mentions 42 months, but Daniel doesn't mention 42 months, but yet we're all talking about a similar period of time, approximately three and a half years. 1335 is a little more than three and a half years. And then Daniel mentions time, times, and half a time. And the book of Revelation also mentions time, times, and half a time. And, and uh, I know traditionally that has been taught that that's three and a half years. And, and that might be correct. But as, as for, for those of you that was here last week, I, it's really interesting because the word behind the word time, times, and half a time as I showed you, the Hebrew script, it, it is the word moed, that's the singular, moedim is the plural, and those are also the words that we use when we start talking about the feast of the Lord. And, and, so, and so embedded in all these, whatever these time passages of the time in, in Daniel and Revelation, is somehow related to the feast of the Lord. And uh, we will talk more about the Feast of the Lord here later on tonight. But, uh, and then uh, finally, the book of Daniel mentions a period of 2,300 days, which is about six years and a third, six and a third years or something like that. And I remember I studied these things, and, and what I did is I was using the calendar that we all know with, you know, January, February, March. And I was, I was playing with the calendar, trying to insert these numbers into our calendar, trying to make sense of it. And I finally decided it, they, the numbers didn't make sense to me. I couldn't figure out how they could possibly make any sense. And I asked God a very simple question. And I asked God, I go, are these numbers symbolic and I should just not even worry about them? Or do they mean something? And and I, I will tell you, this was I'm, this is like 1994. I heard a voice so clearly say, "If you want to understand those numbers, learn the calendar that Daniel used." And and I thought to myself, "Hmm, that's something I never even considered before." And I thought to myself, "What calendar did Daniel use?" Well, he was in the Babylon in captivity. Maybe there is a Babylonian cat, cat calendar. Maybe that's the calendar that he was using. And, and uh, I know today that that's not the case. Daniel was using the calendar that God placed in his word. But at the time that that voice spoke that to me, I had, I had never considered that God had established a calendar in his word and and so I remember starting to study the biblical calendar and and I can remember thinking to myself well, you know I'll study this for a couple of months and I will understand that topic and move on but that isn't what happened I found myself totally fascinated by what we could learn by understanding the calendar that God presents in his word things that I never dreamt of are really explained in, in his word just as I was teaching or preaching on Pentecost Sunday there are stories that I mean I just couldn't bring it all in, in I mean I, I talked plenty long as it was but there was more stories that I could, could have pointed to that was undoubtedly speaking about the day of Pentecost and what God was going to do on that day. Stories that you would just think is innocently disconnected. And yet, when you start understanding the biblical calendar, things start connecting together that you would never, ever dream. And so, so I began my study of the biblical calendar about 1994, and, and I'm still learning. And it's... 
Huh? 18 years. 18 years. I never dreamt that I would still be studying his calendar this many years later. So it was, it was around 2005 that I got a hold of this video on this teaching of Daniel's timeline. And, uh, and so it was not a new topic to me, a lot of the things that he talked about, but his common sense, plain way of presenting, it's like, wow. And it was kind of funny because at that time I had really felt like, like God was wanting me to reconstruct the, the biblical calendar for the last, you know, 70 some years, you know. Because I, it was just something like it was telling me I would learn something by doing that. And, and I did learn some things, and, and it convinced me that God is still using his calendar today. Because there are some things that have happened that make perfect sense when you understand his calendar things that are beyond any of our control that made me, convinced me and, and those are the kind of things I'll, I'll get into later probably a few wins you know a few weeks away from now but it really is extraordinary that that God is the creator and this is his creation yeah, what's going on with all those numbers? So, anyway, the, the, if you ever think about this, and, and this, this, actually, this thought actually came from a friend of mine who, who uh, is, uh, understands a lot of this stuff. And uh, he, he, actually, uh, he actually built himself a, a Newtonian telescope so that he could look into the stars and the and the moons i mean that's he's he's really into this kind of stuff so so yeah some of the things that i can bring into this study i can i can bring in from people that you would never dreamt of i mean i will include some things about sir isaac newton ever hear of sir isaac newton well he had a lot to say on this topic of daniel's timeline it's pretty interesting what he had to say you know, like 250 years ago and some of the things that he believed ends up he knew what he was talking about. He was studying the biblical calendar. He was studying it in Hebrew and Greek. And now we all think of Sir Isaac Newton as this as this really smart scientist that really he was. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> and he was. I mean I mean, generally, the scientific community looks at him and, and say, says, he, he is the clear thinker. He's the guy that got us on the right track. But he spent most of his lifetime studying the Bible, not on, not on theories of, of gravity and things that he worked on. Yeah. It has only been within the last decade that his, that the stuff that he wrote has become public information, and so so there's some of that stuff also ties into this. And again, it, we, we have to be really close to the return of Jesus. We have to be really close. I, I really believe that's what scriptures is telling us when we start to understand these things. So. So anyway, going back to my friend, you know, he's he's kind of into this, you know, building his own telescopes and, and things like this, and 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 I think so. I got this this idea from him, and I th I think it's absolutely right. You ever take a a stop uh, of the old uh, pocket watches, take the back off, and see all the springs and the wheels and the gears all turning and moving, and we know that all that is in motion, so that it will tell us time. Well, that's how we should think of the solar system. That is the creator's pocket watch. And he set all this stuff into motion to tell time, to tell his time. And that's what he said, actually, in, in Genesis. We'll get to that here. So, well, starting off here with some verses here that, that Dewey Bruton starts off with. This is Second Peter 2, or 121 says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So, 
Peter's telling us that prophecy is not the wild imagination of man. It came about because the Holy Spirit inspired this. And also, 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And what does that mean? The way, the way Dewey Bruton likes to say this, it means there's no idle words in scripture. Every word's in there for, for a reason. There's a purpose. It's, it's the word of God is trying to teach us something. It's trying to tell us something. And, and so... So let's, you know, as we, as we establish a foundation here tonight for, for uh, this whole thing, we will, uh, we will see that, some, some, that God has put something together that's really incredible. Okay, so we're going to look at four different things here tonight, just kind of laying down a foundation for actually getting into Daniel's timeline, because if we don't understand some of these things in Daniel's timeline, is a little bit more out there. It's like, what are we talking about? And, and I really don't think any of this is really difficult. And if it seems foreign, it's just because you've never heard it before. But after you've spent some time looking at it and trying to understand it, it's a lot of it's pretty simple. So creation week, we're going to take a look at that first. And so on our calendar, the way we tell time is, is we talk about Sunday, the first day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, we all understand that. And if you've got a clock that has also the, the date on the clock, and you stay up and wait till midnight, like what is today? Today is the 6th. So if you have a clock like that, if you when you get to midnight tonight, you'll... It, it will go from 6-6 six, six to 6-7. Six, because the way we tell time is the day starts and ends at midnight. That's, I mean, probably, I never even thought about such a thing. But that's, that's just the culture that we live in. That's, that's been our understanding forever. You with me? And so, but this is, not what, this is not what is described in the Bible. This is not what's described in Genesis. And, and this, is, this is one of those things. I used to just blow right by it and never, never even consider what the Word is actually saying. So, so, because at the end of every day, I mean, he goes, when God goes through the creation, there's, there's, he every, finishes every day with, there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And then, and then it's the second day. Evening and morning. And so this Hebrew word for evening, Arab, is, is literally referring to the setting of the sun. So as the sun is setting, that ends a day and starts another day on the biblical calendar. And so... That seems, that, when I learned that, it's like, whoa, that seems foreign to me. You can go and talk to a Jew, they understand this. You can go to the land of Israel, you can talk to an Israelite, they understand this. Because they, they grew up, they read this in Hebrew. They, it's very clearly what it's saying. And so, when we go through this, if, if we if superimpose, if I, so, okay, let me also say this, you know, and so in the Hebrew calendar, we don't actually talk about Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We talk about day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and then the Sabbath. Sabbath. I try to trip. I like to trip people up on that one, but Sabbath, yeah, and it was a special day. And and uh, and so, and it's based on Creation Week, which is what we're looking at here. So, what we would on that first day, it says that God created the light. He created day and night, separated them. And then he ends up saying that was evening and morning. So what we would think of as Saturday night when the sun set. 
that was when God began that creation. And when he finished it was, was the setting of the sun on what we would call Sunday night. So that was the first day. I'm just trying to translate from what the Bible speaks to what we're accustomed to. Okay, so the second day then, God creates, or he divides the water, separates the water and from, the, from, from above, so the heavens are separated, and, uh, and he calls that, again, evening, morning, the second day. And then, and then the third day comes along, and he makes dry land, and he puts on the land plants, vegetation. And again, it's evening and morning, the third day. And then on the fourth day, this even in Genesis when he was creating, he said in the evening and the morning was the third day. Yeah, that's how it describes it. And and again, it, the word there for evening is is talking about the setting of the sun. So that's that's what it is. So here comes along day four, and on that day he creates the sun and the moon and the stars. And and this is like my, what my friend was saying that like the, the the solar system, the universe is God's stopwatch. Here's the verse to support that because because in that when He creates the sun, moon, and stars, He says that these are to mark my modim. And and that's the word I threw out at you before that it can either mean a season or it can mean a feast of the Lord. So like Passover. If you came to Passover, that's a moed. moed. That was a moed, or moedim. Moed is singular, moedim is plural. And so God said, I'm putting, I'm putting lights in the sky to mark these times. And so, so it, it is, as, as my friend says, it's the, the universe, the solar system. It's God's pocket watch that he tells time with. Okay, so that's the fourth day. And then on the fifth day, he, uh, he creates the fish of the sea and, and the fowl, the birds to fly in the air. And again, it's evening and morning, the fifth day. And then the sixth day, he creates the animals and man. I guess you cannot read I don't know what happened to this and I don't know why my seven got so big <laughs> yes it's special but you can't read where it says animals and man there I... okay so and so on the seventh day it was special and it was when God rested the other thing I always like pointing out there was was on the sixth day after he created man up until that time, after after every day's creation, he said it was good. But on the on the, after he created man, he said it's very good. And so that tells me what. Sometimes you know we we like to beat up on ourselves and have poor self esteem, but God is calling us. He's calling us His creation. That's very good. Yeah, I wish my seven hadn't gotten big. Isn't that funny? Oh yeah, that that next thing gets really big. You know, I think I got too much animation on that one slide. I think that's what the deal is. We'll just see if we can fool it.
Look at that. I now have man and animals up there, and my seven's not humongous. <laughs> yes. Our computer's fun. <laughs> okay. And so, yeah, the, day, the seventh day is the day of rest. And, uh, okay, so, so, you know, that's the, the biggest thing there that, that, I mean, I think we've all heard the story of, of creation week and all that. But just some things that, you know, if you're going to understand the biblical calendar, one of the things you've got to understand is, is on God's calendar, the day starts at sunset. And it, uh, there's a lot of days, references to days in the Bible, where we don't know how to count the day. And so we wonder how we can't figure out how to count to the number of the days that the Bible talks to. So this is, it becomes a key to understanding day counts in the Bible. Okay, so then, on going back to, to the fourth day. Now, we call that Wednesday, but in the, in the Bible calls that the fourth day. He places the sun and the moon in the, in the sky. So, so since you normally don't see the moon during the day, the first time that the moon would have been visible would have been Wednesday night when the sun was was setting. That would have been the very first time that the moon had, was ever visible for anybody to see on planet Earth. And so there wasn't anybody here. Well, yeah, we had plants that could have looked at it, you know. <laughs> oh, I guess they don't have eyes. So yeah, nobody was here to see it. But, but yeah. And so yeah, I have just a little bitty tiny slither there that you could have seen there. Really hard to see. Especially when nobody was there. So, and and this is this this is really just might seem innocent enough, but but Wednesday, what we would call Wednesday, the fourth day in Bible speak, is when the, the stars, planets, moon was were created, and then Wednesday night. So that'd be like tonight, going out watching the sunset and seeing the moon for the very first time. That's that's what it would, would have been like for creation. Now, how would this play into anything else? It, it does. Some amazing things. Okay, so Isaiah 46.10 says this, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have been done, saying, My purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So, God is saying that, that he, he declared the end from the beginning. In other words, what this is saying is, is when I was telling you there in the beginning, because that's that's really what the book of Genesis is in Hebrew, it's a better sheet, which literally means in the beginning. What I was telling you there in the beginning is describing also the end. And so if we're going to understand prophecy, we need to understand that God was telling us from the very beginning how things are going to play out. And and I do do Bruton when he goes through this teaching, he doesn't go through this. I, I actually went through a period where where I looked at what God created on every day, and I started looking at what happened in the first thousand years, what happened in the second thousand years, what happened in the third thousand years, what happened in the four thousand year period, and the five thousand year period, six thousand per year period, and I think that things there's an amazing parallel between what has happened relating back to the, the six days of creation. So some other verses here that to, to put this all together it says Second Peter says, Second Peter three eight says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice. Now think about this. Peter's saying, there's one thing I don't want you to forget. There's one thing I want you to keep in your mind. And that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And then Psalms 94, written much earlier, says, For a thousand years in thy sight are like yesterday, when it passes by or as a watch in the night. So, so the, very early on, the Jews understood from Scripture that a day was like a thousand years, and that creation week was also telling us something about God's prophetic plan. 
and how they come to the conclusion that a day is like a thousand years is really interesting and it makes sense I ain't going to go into that tonight but but it okay here it is here it is here it is in, in Genesis we read that that Adam and Eve can eat from any anything of the garden except for the the tree of the knowledge and good and, and evil and God says in the day that you eat of this tree you will surely die and Adam and Eve ate from that tree and did not die in that day. They lived to be 900 and some years old. And so the Jews said, Wow, God's mercy, even though he said a day, in that day, it's like a thousand years. Adam and Eve died before they was a thousand years. So a day is like a thousand years in God's sight. That's how they come up with that. Interesting. The other thing that I've also noticed about, the, about God's, I think every little detail is, is God is telling us something. So if you think about, you know, if you, could, if you could convert your thinking here to the way the Bible talks about and day starts in the evening. Well, when the sun goes down, there's still light. And then things get dark. And stay dark. And then the sun rises. And we have light again. And I think each day is a prophetic picture. When Adam and Eve was created, there was a spiritual light. But then darkness soon came. And, they, and we have been spending, you know, this part of our journey, or mankind's journey, in darkness. But there is, the sun is going to rise and light is going to shine on this dark world. I, I really think it's a, there's many layers that we can actually start seeing when we actually th start thinking about why did God put it this way? Lots of things like that we can start seeing. Okay, so, so moving on here. So, so a day is like a thousand years. Six days would be like six thousand years. Speaking of the creation week, so what we know here is, is there was approximately 4,000 B.C. is when Adam was, and the world was created. Approximately 4,000 years. I mean, you can, you'll see different, if, if you want to go, go through and add up all the genealogies and things like that in the Bible, uh, you will find there's about 4,000 years from Adam to, uh, to uh, birth of Jesus. And we know that there's been about another 2,000 years have that have gone by. And that would equal 6,000 years. And it's also, here's, an, here's another thing that I've pulled out from my own study. The ancient Jewish sages taught that there would be 2,000 years of desolation, 2,000 years of Torah, 2,000 years of Messiah, and 1,000 years of rest, or the day of the Lord. And when I, when I read that for the first time, that really just floored me. Because, because I realized that, that Abraham, when he sacrificed Isaac, was about 2,000 years after Adam. And then it was about another 2,000 years that, that Jesus came. And so I'm, I'm looking at that, you know, it's like, wow, you know, it's like for the first 2,000 years, you know, there really wasn't any plan of salvation, so to speak. But then here comes Abraham and Isaac, and, and there God establishes a covenant with Abraham, and, and, and he's showing us the pattern of what he's going to do with Abraham and Isaac, and how, how Abraham the father was going to sacrifice his only son and that's what you that's if you read the story there in genesis that's the way it, way it reads it everybody every jew listened to john 3:16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son they would have had as as a context as a background of 
Abraham sacrificing his only son. So, so then, you know, if, if we think of 2,000 years of Messiah, if we think about, well, gee, you know, there's been about 2,000 years of since, since the Messiah has been reigning in our hearts, then that would be 6,000 years. And so there's 1,000 years. And, they would, and so in the Bible, you will, talk, you will see prophets talking about the day of the Lord. And, and clearly, uh, 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 a belief is uh, among the Jews is that's referring to that thousand-year reign of rest. We are going to rest from our labor. We are going to enter into God's rest for real. And, and, uh, and I had never ever thought about that. I mean, I, I mean, I, because I've read in the, in the prophets, you know, the day of the Lord. It's like, well, what is that? What is the day of the Lord? Well, that's that's definitely a way of understanding that. Is that thousand year reign that represents the seventh millennium or the seventh thousand year period where God will establish rest upon this earth? So, what does all this mean? We don't know exactly how many years from Adam to now. But we know it's right around 6,000. So if we stop right there, this is the first time that we've had 6,000 years of man, history of mankind. And so that right there should say, hmm, the return must be getting near. Are you all with me? Okay. Okay, so that, that was... That was uh, creation week. Now we're going to go into moon phases. And uh, I got up there. Uh, a new moon equals new month. And then I got moon. <laughs> because really that's, that's where our word mo- month comes from. It was this idea of a, of a moon. But we'll explain that a little bit more. So, so as it was practiced in biblical times, when you'd see a little crescent of the moon that would mark the beginning of a month. And the, and the language in the Hebrew is very clear that that, that is what we are talking about. It is, it is the sighting of the moon. Now, in, in, our, in the way we tell time, if you look at your calendar, um, when there is no moon, it would say new moon. But, but if you go back to when all this was, was put into place, Nobody had telescopes that could figure out when that was. The only thing they could do is, ah, there's a little slither of the moon, and that started the new. That was new moon in the Hebrew culture. And and again, it's like, well, Dan, what does this have to do with prophecy? <laughs> it does. There's clearly things that are are being referenced by Jesus to to all this stuff. Okay, so, so looking at the, the Hebrew calendar, we, we'd look at these moon phases, and that's a nice little animation of the moon, what you'd look at if you, if you could see a month's worth on the biblical calendar, what it goes through. So anyway, there, are, there can be as little as 354 days a year. There can be as many as 383 days a year on the, on the Hebrew calendar or the biblical calendar. Or, and then there will, it'll either be 12 months or 13 months every year. And that seems a little foreign to us, but that's, that's why it works. And then the Gregorian calendar, the calendar that we use, it's, we know this, 365 days a year, and then every four years we have a leap year, which is 366 days. And there's always 12 months because it's solar-based. And so... Our months are no longer from new moon to new moon, but rather our months have been, days have been added to them to make it so that there's always 12 months per year. So that, that makes these two calendars always inconsistent with each other. And, and this is, I, I believe this, and it can, maybe doesn't seem this way at first, but, but I think God's calendar is very simple. But if you start trying to convert back and forth, that's when we start getting confused because they're inconsistent. So here's an example. 
Every year, Passover is on the first is in the first month on the fourteenth day. It is always every year. It's on that day. It might be on a Wednesday. It might be on a Friday. This last year it was on a Friday. It might it could be on any day of the week, but it's always the first month, the fourteenth day. And but it can be anywhere from March to April on our calendar. So complete inconsistency. Here's another one. Independence Day. At every year, that's July 4th on our calendar. It's always July 4th. But if you looked at it back on the biblical calendar, the Hebrew calendar, it's the third or fourth month. It varies. So trying to convert these back and forth, that's, that's, where, you, that's where you get confused. But the biblical calendar itself is seems pretty simple to me. If you can count moons, you can do it. Okay. So here, here's an example of some of the moon phases. So, now, as, as Dewey Britton says, he goes, a, a complete moon cycle is 29.5 solar days. And if you went to NASA's website and asked them, you know, they would, they would have 29.5 and then followed by another number about to 10 digits, you know. They've really calculated this out. But what this means is, so from new moon to moon, new moon is 29 and a half days. So in, pra in practical application, a biblical month, a Hebrew month is either 29 days or 30 days in length. And so, so we start with the first crescent, visible crescent, which would be the first day of the, of the month. And then that, that crescent there would be about the fourth day. When you can see about half of the moon, that would be about the, starting about the second week or the eighth day. And actually, it's kind of funny because is I, can, I can look up at, this, up at the sky at night and see the moon and, and have a really good idea what day on the calendar is. It's funny how you're, you can train your eye to, to see what day approximately is that you're at. And, and again, I mean, we're talking about this is the creator. He said there in Genesis 1 that he puts these lights in the sky to mark the days, his feasts, his seasons. And so then about the 14th or the 15th is what we would normally think of as the full moon. And so every Passover, there is a full moon. It's always that way. And then as it starts to, to wane, there's about the 18th day. And then we're looking at about the third week when it's about half now. And then uh, 26th day when it looks about like that. And then about when you get, end up with just a little slither, it's probably about the 28th day or something like that. And then we have no moon. And in biblical times, the, the way it was practiced here, it says that up until 70 A.D. When the, when the temple was destroyed by, by the Romans, the way it, the way it was practiced was they was looking for two witnesses that had seen the moon. And they would go to the temple and they would, and they would shout up and say, hey, we have seen the moon. And then they would, they would have the priest that would say, come up hither or come up here which is really reminiscent of what we read in the book of Revelation and, and so then people would go up and they would verify yes there has been the sighting of the new moon and then they would go to the mountaintops there in Jerusalem and they would light a bonfire on the mountain signaling to adjacent mountains that this a new month had begun and and uh, that's the way it was practiced in biblical times. Um, after the destruction of the temple, the, the Jews realized we could no longer do this. And then especially once the Roman Empire drove them out of the land, now the, now the Jews found themselves no longer in the land of Israel. How do we keep track of, the, of, of God's calendar? And so there was this rabbi, Rabbi Hillel II. He came along and came up with this little mathematical formula 
to calculate the new moon. And, and he'd done a really good job. You know, 1,800 years later, um, if you looked at a Jewish calendar, um, it, can, it can be dead on with the sighting of the moon. It can be up to two days off. And that's pretty amazing that he was able to get it that accurate. Working on the, on the biblical calendar myself, I know that it, you, you really can't define it with a mathematical formula. There's, there's just a certain uncertainty as to when the moon is going to make itself visible again. So that's, that's the reason why there's really kind of a, there's, I kind of refer to the, to the rabbi's calendar, which is based on a mathematical formula. But then there's the true biblical calendar, and that's what I've been more interested in and what I've more studied because because that, it started answering some questions about prophecy. And so, from the time that there is no moon in the sky, to the time that there is a visible crescent once again, it's approximately 48 hours. It can vary quite a bit. And because it could vary so much, this period of time, by New, by New Testament times, became known as the day and hour that no man knows. And, and if you remember the words of Jesus, that's what he was talking about when he was describing his return. So he was saying that it would come on a day and hour that no man returns. So how the people would have understood that listening to him in, in his day is different than how we understand it. To them, it would have been a clue. It's like, ooh, ooh. Because it just so happens to be that one of the feasts of the Lord takes place on the first day of the month. And that would be the Day of Trumpets. And so, just putting those little pieces together right there. And this is one of the things that I never, ever dreamt I would learn from studying the biblical calendar. The, the Day of Trumpets is... is the day and hour that no man knows. And, and if you read Paul's writings on prophecy, he's talking about the last trumpet. And, and this, is, this is the culture. This is, this is the biblical understanding that they had. Okay. So, moving on. We are going to talk about the Feast of the Lord. And, and this is something that I, I would never have thought in a million years until I started studying this stuff. But if you want to understand the prophetic blueprint to God's plan, learn the feast. If you want to understand what everything that God is going to accomplish to fulfill all prophecy, learn the feast. And, and that just, if somebody would have told me that when I first started studying this thing, I would have said, yeah, right. And today, I believe it with absolute certainty. I, I just, it's one of the reasons why it's in my heart to reintroduce things like Passover, to reintroduce things like Pentecost, and also the Fall Feast too, because, because I think we start getting a clear, clearer picture of what the Bible is talking about. And so, this is Leviticus 23, 1, 2. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. And, and this word feast here, I was, I've already mentioned this Hebrew word here. It's, it's moedim. And that's on day four of creation. God says, I'm putting lights in the sky to mark my Moedim, or my feast, or to mark my special days. He goes, I'm putting lights in the sky to mark that. And, and eventually I'm going to show you with some computer software some, some coming lights in the sky that just, when I discovered this, they, they really shook me up. And, and some of you have seen what I'm talking about. So, and the other thing I'd need to be pointed out here 
is that this, these are the feasts of the Lord. A Hebrew word there is Yehovah. These are his feasts. They are not Jewish feasts. These are his special days, not Jewish special days. That's, I mean, that's just the language there. <laughs> it says, these are my feasts. And, and connecting all these dots, we'll, we'll put some of this together here. So when we look at the Feast of the Lord, there are seven of them. So Passover is one of them. And then immediately following Passover, a seven-day thing of unleavened bread. And then we have somewhere in those seven days, there's going to be the first day of the week, or we call it Sunday, or the day after the Sabbath, as the Bible talks about it. There's going to be a first fruit, an offering of barley to, to the Lord. And then... We count seven sevens, or we have Pentecost, as we know it. Shavuot is the Hebrew word, and that Shavuot is the plural for the word weeks. If I, if I said Shavua, that would be week. If I said Shavuot, that would be weeks. And, and Daniel talks about 70 weeks. And he's telling us something, but we have not put it this together here. Or typically have not. And then, so then we have the Day of Trumpets, we have Atonement, Day of Atonement, and then we have Sukkot, as it's known in Hebrew. And, and you'll, in our English translations, you'll see it as the Feast of Weeks, or Feast of, excuse me, Feast of Booths, or Feast of Tabernacles, depending upon which translation you're reading from. But clearly, clearly this feast is also the wedding supper of the Lamb. Clearly is that. And as you, as you learn about the details of that, of that particular day, clearly the wedding supper of the Lamb is going to take place on that day, on that week. Okay, so looking at, at the Hebrew calendar, it's always the first month. Passover is always the first month, 14th day of that, where it can be anywhere from March to April on our calendar. And then the 15th through the 20, 21st, the seven-day thing, there is, there is, um, is when the Feast of Unloved Bread takes place. Again, that's March or April. The, the word in Hebrew there for that first month is Aviv, but sometimes in our translations you see it as, as Abib. So if you, re, if you read this stuff in your Bible, I've got both words up there. Um, the Hebrew word and the English translation of it. And, uh, and then first fruits, some, sometime during that seven day period, there is going to be a day after the Sabbath, and that is, that is when the, the first crop of the land of Israel is offered to, to God. And, and uh, that, again, that's March or April. And then we count seven weeks plus one day, or we count 50 days, which is where we get the word Pentecost. And that puts us in the third month, and currently that's where we're at on the, on the biblical calendar, is we're in the third month, or the Hebrew calendar. And so that's in May or June of every year. And then, you should be able to guess this, because what, what is, you know, God's numbers here, you know, with three, seven, you know, those. So there is a four-month break, so trumpets then takes place in the seventh month on the first day of the week. The day and hour that no man knows. So when you read stuff in the in the New Testament where where Jesus is going through Samaria, he's talking to a woman at the well, and the and the disciples come back and it's like, hey Jesus, you haven't had anything to eat, and he's like, oh, God, my food is to do the will of the Father. And then Jesus says this: Do not say four months and then the harvest, but the harvest is now. What is well, that? Is, Jesus gave us a clue here. That would have taken place right around, right around Pentecost, because then there is this four-month break in the land of Israel before the harvest picks up again. Those just those are some of those things that you would learn by by learning the Hebrew calendar. That why did Jesus say four months? Do not say four months, and then the harvest. That's the reason why. Okay, so so then. Uh, so that's going to be September, October. And this is, this is I, I remember noticing this. You know, the word sept means seven. But it's the ninth month on our calendar. And October, oct, 
that's eight, but it's the tenth month, and it is a reflection back on before they modified this calendar, how it used to be based upon the biblical calendar. There's, there is a testament in our own calendar that there is a calendar that God established first. Did you ever think, why do we have a seven day week? Did you ever stop and think about that? The Creator established it. The Roman Empire actually tried to create a 10 day week. People would not accept it. The, our, the, the Creator established his calendar. Okay, so the Day of Atonement is on the 10th day, and then uh, still in September, October, and then Sukkot. Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booth is it is a seven day feast 15th through the 21st again September through October so if we look at this of all the days that Jesus could have been crucified God chose Passover and along with unleavened bread representing a removal of sin and that is what Jesus came for and somewhere during that time we're going to have the day after the Sabbath the first day of the week where we offer our first crops back to God and what does Jesus do? He takes those that were in bondage in hell and he takes them and presents them to the Father on that day. Coincidence or by design? I tell you, it's by design. And I, I, I never will forget the day when, when it hit me. It's like Passover. The three principal feasts are Passover, Pentecost, and and. Uh, Booths, Feast of Tabernacles, those are the three principal feasts, or seven in total. And, it, and it, I remember the day it hit me. It was early on when I started studying the biblical calendar. It's like Passover and Pentecost. Those are two of the three major days, Feasts of the Lord. And those, when, those are what, the days that God chose to have Jesus crucified. And that's Pentecost is the day that God chose to pour out His Spirit. This cannot be coincidence. This is by design. God did this for a reason. He's trying to communicate this, what he's doing. But we've been so quick just to scoot it on by and, and ignore this stuff. But he's telling us something very profound. And again, like I said, I started studying this stuff in like 1994, thinking that this would be a short-lived study. And I'm still totally in awe of the whole thing. He is the creator, and he made creation. And his creation speaks of what he's doing. So what we see here, then, is the Day of Trumpets, Atonement, and, and Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast, Feast of Booths. Those things have not yet been fulfilled. And I believe that they are, we're getting close to those things being fulfilled. And so these are these are God's days, things that he does. Here's another way of looking at it. If you look at compared to the spring feast and the fall feast, they start in the first month, but notice the day count is, is the first day we look for, for ripe barley, and that determines the first day of the month. But on the first day of the seventh month, we have trumpets. On the tenth day, we select the Passover lamb. On the tenth day, we have atonement. On the 14th, there's nothing in the 7th month. But then the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the 15th through the 21st. The Feast of Tabernacles is the 15th through the 21st. Then when we come to the end of Unleavened Bread, we count seven sevens later or 50 days later. And we have Pentecost. But then immediately following that is, is the great last great day, as it's called in the New Testament. And, and, and so you can see that, that God has a pattern in how he selected these days. And so, yeah, just, just a little quick thing. This is really what marks the beginning of the year is when you've got ripe barley. That would, that would be marking the first month on the biblical calendar, on the Hebrew calendar, and the sighting of the new moon. Okay, so that pretty much takes us through the moon phases. And, no, that was the Feast of the Lord. Now we're getting ready to 
go into manna week. Yeah, that was the feast of the Lord that we were talking about there, Passover and Pentecost. You know, because the feast of the Lord, you can't keep the feast of the Lord without understanding his biblical calendar. And so they become intertwined as you start to understand them. Okay, so now what we're going to do here is, and this, this is Dewey Bruton's te teaching here. It's very fascinating. This is a, a good example of the kind of things that we can learn by understanding the biblical calendar. And this is just to illustrate as we get in, before we go into Daniel, Daniel's timeline, the things that we can expect to learn. So here if in Exodus 12, verses 1 and 3, it says, says, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each to take are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. And so here God is describing, this is the first month of the year. But what we don't know is what day of the week did, was this said, and what, what day is the Sabbath on. These are things that we don't know because it doesn't say such and such day is such and such. But in scripture, by understanding the biblical calendar, we can figure out when this happened. Okay, so Exodus 16, 1, 2. It says, When they set out from Elam, and all the congregations of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness, wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, after their departure from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Okay, so... This just told us something. The 15th day of the second month. Now, I, I used to read by that stuff, and I said, I don't have any clue what that means, and I just ignore it and read on. But I know what this stuff means now. So, on 2.15, the second month, 15th day, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So, what day is that? Again, you would think, we don't know, but we'll pay attention to additional scriptures here. Exodus 16, verses 4 and 5, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instructions. And it will come about on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So God is saying, on 2.15, God is saying, Okay, they're going to, go out and gather for six days and on the sixth day they're going to gather twice as much because the seventh day they're going to rest and so there must be 215 must be a Sabbath and we'll keep we'll keep reading here to verify that this is true Exodus 1626 says six days you shall gather it but on the seventh day the Sabbath there will be none so as we read this chapter of, of when God brought manna, he is telling us six days and then the seventh day is going to be a Sabbath. So we have now have learned that the 15th is a Sabbath. Did you follow that? Well, I'll try to illustrate this a little bit here. Okay, I'm going to guess that that is a Sabbath. So that means the 16th would be a Sunday. And the 17th would be a Monday. And a Tuesday. And a Wednesday. And a Thursday. And a Friday. And so then the 22nd would be another Sabbath. Because we're going to gather for six days. And then the seventh day, on the sixth day you're going to gather twice as much because the seventh day is the Sabbath. So, there's, I'm, I'm saying that's the Sabbath. There's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And another scripture up here says, See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days. On the sixth day, remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So here, if we just simply pay attention, God did not say, you're going to gather for three days and then the Sabbath. 
It's six days. So we know that 2.15 is the Sabbath. So, taking Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to Saturday, and I put in here the 15th and the 22nd, because we have now learned that those would have been Sabbaths on, on the biblical calendar, our calendar too. And we're just going to count backwards. And so here we count backwards. And, and we come to, this is the second month, so now the, this here is in, is in the first month, so we just keep counting backwards here. And so here's what we learn, is the 10th day they was to take a lamb it, it fell on a Sabbath, and the 14th, when they left Egypt, would have been um, when they had their Passover. And, and this is, this is kind of interesting. So if we put, start putting a few more pieces together, seven days of unleavened bread for that year. Creation week, if you remember that, it was on the fourth day that we created the, the sun, the moon, stars. And then that evening would have been the first time that the moon had ever been sighted. Well, also it would have been the first time that sighted for the, for the man a week, the year that Israel come out of Exodus or out of Egypt, excuse me. When it would have been identical to creation week. So not only is it like creation week. And he's and I mean, are you getting this picture here? It's like creation, that's like a new beginning. And Israel being brought out of bondage, that's like a new beginning. And it just so happens to be, when we start putting the pieces together, that in every case, there was a moon sighted on the evening of the fourth day as we go into the fifth day. Also, crucifixion week would have also looked like this. And again, we're talking about a new beginning. Creation, we're talking about a new beginning. Israel coming out of Egypt, we're talking Jesus being crucified, we're talking about a new beginning. This is, this is not, this is not by chance. The, the Creator did this. So, look how much information we got with just one biblical date and understanding the, the biblical calendar. And that's the kind of stuff that once you understand the biblical calendars, there's things that starts coming alive that's like, you, you don't think it's in the Bible, but it's there. The information is there if you'll study it out. So. Did you grasp all that? <laughs> Next week, we will go into applying the biblical calendar to, to Daniel's timeline. And uh, I, that's what I really think people need to hear. I share this stuff as, as a foundation so that people can understand the biblical calendar. And uh, did you follow all this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> 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 you're not alone. 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 You're not